So, oh. so we're uh, we're at uh, Clark Coolidge's. I'm Neely Cherkovsky, and uh, we're at his house in Petaluma. I won't say the name of the street, uh, but it's something like Prospect. Anyway, uh, uh, we we had a, I, I had an iced tea before we got here, and uh, Clark and I are reading tomorrow night at Green Arcade Books. And I thought it'd be great to uh, document Clark and get a few words in edgewise at the same time. And uh, it seems to me a special moment because Clark's um, book, Poet, which is over 300 pages, uh, is coming out from Pressed Wafer. And it's dedicated to the great late friend of Clark and, and I, I mean, a friend of Clark's for many decades and mine for maybe 15 years, David Meltzer. I think Clark was really taken with a, this Pocket Poet series number 50, <coughs> When I Was a Poet. And I was taken with David when we taught at New College of California because we had never really had much uh, business between one another before then, and I found out what a great friend he could be because I think he was a friend to so many people. It was his practice to be your friend, to be your helping hand, to be the person who listens to you so deeply. Like at poetry readings, some young poets are reading and nobody really is sure who they are that much, you know, or what they're going to read. and Everybody's listening, but the person who's really listening is David Meltzer. And I mean every word, and you can see him dancing on the letters. Uh, it's, it's really something. I wonder, Clark, if, if you could talk about your relationship with David, like when you met him and... Sure. Um, I met him in the summer of 1963 when I was on my way, I was living in Providence, Rhode Island then, and I was on my way to this 1963 uh, Vancouver Poetry Festival. Mm -hmm. And I went to City Lights, of course, and then I went next door to the Discovery Bookstore, and David was working behind the counter. And we in, it's one of those friendships where you just start talking, because it never stops, you know, it's just, I, you know, two nights later I was a guest at his house for dinner when they lived on Jones Street, I, I asked him later, how come so quick, you know, you, you invited me immediately, you didn't even know me, so well, I knew you, you know. So after that, I remember he also, he warned me about Olson. He said, don't pay attention to that guy, he'll try to turn you into something you're not, you know, don't. <laughs> well, wow. Actually, I got a, a big kick out of Olson, but I, I kind of know what he meant, because a lot of people fell into his spell. And, you know, followed him to Buffalo and all that kind of thing. But so anyway, um, then we corresponded, and in 65, I came out to the Berkeley Poetry Conference, which I don't think David went to. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. he had, I mean, certain poets, I know Phil Whalen refused to go to that, and McClure, I believe. They, uh, I think Phil had taught there for a semester and didn't feel a bit right. well treated. Um, and I remember going across and seeing Phil and then going to David's and so on. But then by 67, I had lived in New York and was close to R.M. Soroyan. And when he was doing his one-word poems and all that far-out stuff, and we ended up living next door to each other on West 85th Street, and then we moved to a house in Cambridge that winter. And it was getting impossible, you know, like I had just been divorced and I couldn't meet women when I was around Arm. I mean, somehow we interfered with each other. <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about him, but just, you know, I had to, we both had to get out of there. And actually, within months of leaving that relationship, we both got married to different people who we had not even known. Them. Well, anyway, I get this letter from David just at the right time <laughs> saying, I got a contract, I got a band, I got a contract with Vanguard, we gotta have a drummer come out. 
I was like on the next plane. I, mean, I couldn't oh, wait to get. Oh God! <laughs> and then you know we made that record right away, and then we played at the at the Fillmore uh, on a night which was celebrating Country Joe and the Fish's first album, which was also on Vanguard, being produced by the same producer, Sam Charter, um, who had never produced a rock band before. And, uh, I don't think really knew what he was doing. Anyway, he buried me in the mix. I, I always held it against him. <laughs> the guy's gone now. I should speak ill. But anyway, the band totally broke up, including David's wife, Tina, who we found out years later. I mean, I'm sure David knew it, but she never wanted to be in a band like that. She wanted to be a jazz singer, yeah. or as we used to call him, a thrush. <laughs> <laughs> She's the only woman I ever know that didn't take insults from being called a thrush. Right. So anyway, David and I put together another band, which is more like a free jazz band, and, and played a lot at the coffee gallery and uh, Dino and Carlos, hmm. and then broke up because uh, David, they were, he had three little Amazing. girls and he needed money and he thought this free band was great, but nobody, but we actually had a good good crowd and we had a, you know, a small audience that came and I then met Susan who married and got pregnant right away and had our daughter and then three years later we moved here. So there was a gap there. When you break up a band there's always like difficulties. The chemistry has gone askew mm. and I think that we kind of held it against each other a little bit about that because mm. we had some very high moments playing music. And that's, that's one thing David and I talked about in recent years, that once you have that experience, you have a sense of each other that you couldn't have any other way. And I think it's really valuable and rare. Um, you know, I mean, it was a shame, I thought, that David, he finally got such arthritis that he couldn't play the guitar anymore. And he was supposed to be in this free band, the Ouroboros. And it was called Ouroboros because of the serpent, serpent power. You know? But he couldn't. But um, anyway, I'm rambling on. But but you know he at one point they moved to England. Do you remember that episode? He he'd been living in Mill Valley, and they yeah. David had decided. I mean, this is very David. Um, no, there was no more politeness in America. I mean, he, God, he should. I mean, <laughs> we won't talk about it today. But anyway. Um, so we got to move to England where they they're still mm. have some kind of decorum and society. So of course it was ill-advised because they got there and nobody had a job and nobody had any money and you no know, place to live and they dragged their feet back and, and lived in Bolinas for a while. Where I re-met him because Bill Berkson, another friend of mine, lived right across the street from him, and we kind of fell into each other's arms and you know. Uh, why haven't I seen you in years and just picked right up because you know, the friendship was so strong and I think it was more because of the music and as you said the, a few minutes ago the humor than the poetry I mean we, of course we shared we were poets and uh, had a wonderful time in the later years reading together many times uh, out here at Moe's and various venues and we got into this thing of trading poems, you know, like a musician would, like they say, trade fours, you know, four bars of you, four bars of me, but, you know, and that was a wonderful inspiration for both of us. And I think I spent many evenings reading with him, reading parts of that poem when I was a poet, before it was published. Uh -huh. And in fact, it seemed to me it was longer, and there are parts that I don't recognize in there uh, that I heard him read. And I began to have this kind of questioning session with myself about what is, what is this thing that we're doing, you know. And he had this, to me, strange title, When I Was a Poet. You know, I used to always say, well, what do you mean, you're not a poet anymore? I mean, of course, you're a poet. Well, no, and then he'd, he'd make a joke and he'd laugh, you know. But, so I never really found out what that title meant, except that maybe he was accepting the fact that he was about to step out. You know? Well, that's and interesting. A couple of the readings we did, he was uh, we read up in Nevada City, and he read a another draft of when I was a poet because I remember it being much shorter, huh. and I remember having somewhat of the same reaction, you know, what the hell, you know, and and I immediately thought of what 
Kyle, what you and I were talking about earlier, I was saying that, you know, Phil Whalen, because he got, you know, the eye problem, he stopped writing. He didn't want to find a way to write. And then an interesting thing happened. Jack Foley called him one day and he said, I'd like you to come on the radio and read your poems. He said, I can't read, I'm blind. And Jack said, Homer did. And Whalen said, Homer who? So, the, so typical of Whalen. But I was thinking also, not only Phil Whalen, but Eliot did four quartets. And, and in terms of poetry, he closed up shop. He still wrote his essays and plays, and there's certainly no value judgment there, but he didn't need to write any more poems. And so I, I did talk to David about that, and uh, I did say, uh, uh, what about when I wasn't a poet? And so did a lot of other people. People were making uh, playoffs on David's title and were perplexed by it, much mm -hmm. as, as you were. And um, But in a way, you preempted Bukowski, who's dead because... He wanted to write a novel. He kept telling me, I'm going to write a novel called Poet. Oh, really? No. And that's going to be my final novel. He had written this uh, uh, pulp, the, uh, which yeah. was a playoff on on, uh, on all the uh, the old detective stuff, and uh, which he had grown up with, especially Chandler and Hammett, uh, the usual suspects. And so Poet was going to be the next one. Oh. Not a poem. And so you've got poet and uh, I think David is looking down very happy and uh, I've already heard some of the poem read and uh, it certainly blew everyone's mind at uh, uh, Bird and Beckett. Well, I was but, amazed that as far as I know there, nobody's ever used that title. I mean maybe there is somewhere who knows in the wide world but uh, as far as I know um, not. And well, I, I wouldn't have thought of it except for David. You, you know, got it, and, and you and you do have it, and you know. And um, I was a little bit. I was thinking to myself, why didn't I do that? I would have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now is everybody going to do? You know, Everyone's going to say that. <laughs> why did Clark get to do it? And you know, I, I mean, I have like poetry 2016, poetry 2018. So maybe I'll write poetry, I don't know, but but uh, poet, it actually, for poets, I think it's going to be such a beacon. I mean, that I predict, because just Poet by Clark Coolidge, and uh, I think that's going to sort of light the way, um, much as when I was a poet did. And of course, if you look at David's book, from a distance, you see Poet yeah. first, anyway. Yeah, I don't know if that was his idea or not. So, uh, I don't know, yeah. I just know that that book is very important to him, to be published in that series, you know. And, uh, oh. You know, it was a big occasion. He was, he was so happy, uh, so happy to uh, be brought into the fold, or crowded into the fold. Because he also say, he used to say to me, I'm not a beat, I wasn't a beat poet. I, you know, the, those the guys we know, you know, Alan and Jack and all those guys, they were the beat poets. I was a young kid, you know. But he was in North Beach at that time. He read his poems to jazz, you know, in the place and, and so and so and, he, so he, and he did the book beat thing. Uh, yeah, well then Then he then he sort of accepted it maybe. Well but, he did this funny thing about the past, you know, he he used to rail against people talking constantly about the past, and yet he was totally into it, you know? And he did write Beat Thing, and we used to talk about all those days a lot, you know? And then he would say, well, and then I'd, I'd bring him up on it, you know, say, yeah, but you always say that you hate people to do that. And he said, no, well, no, I, what I hate is pastness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I kind of know what he means. Listen, it's better to be thought of as a beat poet. I, I was in the Sierra, Poetry Festival a couple of months ago, I think two months was that about? And I was driving to, to Provo, Utah with my publisher from Colorado and I looked at the email and it advertised Neely Tcharkovsky, Meat Poet, Meat. that's M-E-A-T. And I said, Danny, stop the car. 
And I got on the phone to the people, what is this meat poet? And she says, well, I don't know, we thought it was something. Somebody said you're a meat poet. I said, Michael, I'm Michael not... McClure is a meat poet. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a meat poet. So she said she would take it out. It turns out that when the festival was on, they introduced me just as a poet. And in the program, but it still said meat poet. And it didn't seem to matter then. But uh, uh, that reminds me when I, when I first met David. Or when, I, when we really, I had given him a copy of a book of mine, Animal. And he came up to me at an abandoned Planet bookstore. And David's way, he grabbed my arm and he said, Neely, I want to tell you something, how much I love that book. And my immediate reaction, it's a little bit cruddy, I said, gee, it took so long for you to acknowledge me. He said, Neely, it came, and as long as it comes, that's all that matters. <laughs> You're part of the family. And then I found that that's a trope of David's, a beautiful one, because he then a few months later, he was editing a poem of mine. I said, thank you so much for taking the time. He said, no, thank you for giving me the time. Oy vezmir, you know, what are you going to do with that? It's just so generous. And, uh, and, and several other people have said that to me, talked about his generosity. That reminds me of a thing, I was friendly with Philip Guston. We had many long conversations, and at one point I came over to his studio and I said, you know, I wrote this poem, you know, and it's good, but I felt like it came too easy, you know, it didn't take any work, it, just, it, it makes me feel uneasy. He said, oh, hey, let me tell you, man, he said, I don't want to be a foxy grandpa, but man, when that happens, you take it, believe me, because Ooh. it's not going to happen too many oh. times. <laughs> I went, one well, Okay. <laughs> he said that, you take it, yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah. Which you did. And Which I, of course. What about in general with your poetry? Because something I always wondered, if, if one thing a person could say about Clark Coolidge is he's prolific, <laughs> you know, and then there's so much beyond that, of course, but you're very prolific. I, I have to ask you, how, how often does that happen? How long is it, you know, Alan says, first thought, best thought. Then there's the idea of spontaneity. There's the idea that it's all in your head anyway, and it's going to come out at that moment, and you just receive it. So where are we with that in, in your process? Like the sonnets, for example, or, or whatever, you well, know? That's the word. You, you, you said it, process. I mean, I'm a process guy. Uh, I, was, I had, uh, just yesterday, the sax player from the Rova, um, Bruce Ackley, was here. And we played for hours out and back, and he got talking about my poetry and said, "Well, you, you know, I think you're a kind of process thing." I said, "You got it." And, you know, and <laughs> so I write all the time. I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't want to say it flows out, but somebody looking at me might think so. You know? <laughs> and it's not that I love everything I wrote or anything, but beautiful. But, um, I just have to do it, and you know, then I can take chunks out of it, like 88 sonnets. I just took, I found myself writing 14 line poems for five or six years. I don't wow. know why. I never liked old fashioned forms or anything, but wow. maybe that proves something about those 14 line poems. I mean, the, the tradition of the sonnet. I mean, you know, you can't kill Shakespeare, or, you know, many great sonnet writers. Uh, but I didn't do it to, to make sonnets. I mean, I just found myself writing ending in 14 lines, or I'd get to 13, and I'd realize, and then I'd write another line, almost as if I had to make it 14. And it kind of drove me nuts for a while, you know, thinking when I wasn't writing, you know, looking at it, thinking, what are you doing? You, know, you never wanted to write sonnet. Well, maybe like he said, you know, it's, it fell to you, so go, you know, just keep doing it. So I always thought with your sonnets, I haven't looked at copyright dates but <laughs> to investigate, but I've always thought there was a connection with, with Ted Berrigan with, and Bernadette and yeah, yourself yeah, in terms of the three of you. And there's some others too, but basically I'm thinking of the three of you that you aided one another Ted that way. Ted Berrigan particularly. Yeah. I think his sonnets were a big influence on both Bernadette and me because we're both younger. Yeah. I mean, she's younger than me, but I'm enough younger than Ted. Right. You know, 
And that book was a huge inspiration for everybody in New York. I mean, that when it came out in the year of 65 wow. or one of them, <coughs> the, uh, wow. the uh, what do you call it, the mimeographed edition. You know, and then Royal Press picked it up. But, nice. uh, you know, he was doing, I mean, it's a kind of a collage style in a way. And I, he one time opened a drawer and showed me all these little cut pieces of paper where he'd cut out, like he'd type out a whole page full of lines and then cut each line out and mix them all <laughs> up and throw them. You know, I said, well, yeah, I know we're, we're into John Cage and, you know, Burroughs. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not my process. I mean, I write, uh, it's sort of like I think John Ashbery said one time, Somebody said, well, how did you get to the point where you were writing all these kind of disconnected things, but they fit? And he said, I just, I just learned to do it. I, just, I was like trained my head to do wow. it. I, I don't have to cut it up. Wow. You know, oh, I think God. we all did cut it up when we were younger, and when we first discovered Burroughs and, oh, and Cage and all that random you know, indeterminacy thing. It was a kick, but I could never, and Jackson McClough, I think, never forgave me because he'd say, how come you didn't keep working on chance composition? I said, I said man, I, I just wasn't, you know, you took it, you, know, you, you had it, you know, you did everything I could think of. I had to, I mean, that happens, you know, with your friends or other poets, somebody who did something great. You can't do that. I mean, you're inspired. God knows what inspired really means, but it means you do something else. You know, it made you do that. Sometimes you could see a little phrase or something that he might. might. Yeah. I mean, we all stole from each other like that, like hell. I mean, you know, I don't, who was it? Tom Clark said, nobody owns the words. I mean, he, mm -hmm. and of course we don't. I mean, and that's great. I mean, what if somebody did own the words? I mean, <laughs> we wouldn't be poets like we are. But, um, but then you a, also have a body of poems that are much more narrative, like poet. It's going to be more of a chronological thing, right? And so it's it's like a, it's, it's, so I want to ask too because you're writing all the time, like I I feel that way. Do you ever feel burdened by the poem? Do you ever get angry at poetry? Let's say that, and, and I got to go away for a while. I got to go to a garden. I got to take a walk. Enough already. Well, you see, because I have music, too. Yeah. And I started as, as a musician. I mean, my father was yeah. a classical violinist, and I picked up drums and God. piano and became a jazz nut. And uh, the, I have a set of drums I keep set up back in the <laughs> studio, and I can go there anytime and bang, and, you know, make, make my own pattern, do whatever I want, you know. So, and that's a great relief. It's a relief from what you say, because it does get to be a burden. And, sitting there with a typewriter, you know, just by yourself and still and, you know, you kind of, it, with drums you use all of the, you know, the wow. arms and legs and, and, you know, you're, uh, I don't know how to talk about it, but it, it, it's, it's been a great um, revelation and release to me. Yeah. Because I think, my poetry I think is a lot, very inspired by jazz rhythm and, mm. and, and which mm. I, you know, I mean, I, talked about this many times when I first read On the Road when it came out and I was at Brown majoring in geology and I never should have. I was just a kid collecting rocks. I didn't, I didn't know what it would be to have a career, you know, and, and geology was becoming, you know, a lot of equations and, you know, a lot of math and stuff that I never could do in school. So, you know, I read Jack's book and I saw right away that he was improvising, you know, and I knew yeah. about improvising because I was already playing jazz. Yeah. And I thought, he doesn't know what's at the end of that sentence. And, and part of the great, wonderful thing about his books is you want to know, too. You know, you, you're, you're on the same line as him if you're really in it. You know, he doesn't know wh where it's going to get. He may have his pocket notebooks and he's yeah, yeah. referring to a trip. You know, and he's talking about some gas station, but when he writes about it, it's going to go beyond that. It's going to go somewhere, and he wants to know where that is, and we want to know too. Well, that's why we read him. We don't read him like John Updike or some comment on society or something. It has nothing to do with it. That's why I get so pissed off when Ann Charters wrote that first biography. She didn't. She dealt with him as a sociological figure, mm. and that is not what's interesting about him. Yeah. At least not to writers, I mean, or some of us. <laughs> very, very interesting. What about when you're 
<clears throat> when you're writing, um, I was talking to Kyle earlier about my process of it. I rarely sit down without somebody's book hmm. at my side. Sometimes it's, it's I, I, I mean, it's true. You're uh, selected recently. Mm -hmm. And I look for, or uh, Bernadette, or um, I go back and I, I pick up the, uh, the cantos, or whatever it is. I'm not thinking right. Uh, Williams, it, yesterday I picked mm -hmm. up Williams, and I'm looking for a word, and then I'm surprised. Sometimes it's just the word and. I mean, it gets to be ridiculous. You say, why did I need William Carlos Williams and? But I needed it in order to go on, you know. Yeah. And why did I need, you know, uh, the tree from uh, Anna Akhmatova, like mm -hmm. earlier this morning? I did. I needed her saying it. And, and it, then it gets more Baroque sometimes, but I need those. I don't know if that uh, you do that at all. You know, I, I, I admit I, I'm using these people. I'm taking... Well, words. well, if you look in there, I mean, the room I use to write, I've got all those writers on the shelves. <laughs> you know, the people that I go to always, I want them right at hand. You know, I mean, there's a whole shelf of New York guys, a beat guy, Kerouac, Ginsburg, Corso, that stuff, the <laughs> Ashbury, then, then Beckett, yeah. you know, Burroughs, um, Wallace Stevens, Williams. You know, all those guys have to be Where? near me and, and sometimes I will you know, I don't say I'm stuck or something but I you know I lean back and then I th go over and I grab something made me think of say Williams sometimes a specific poem sometimes not you know but, but I, I'm not laughing at and I mean I <laughs> I've literally done that I mean you know and Williams is doing something with and that somebody else is not doing and I want to get in the presence of that again. I mean, I know it, but I want to, you know, I used to type up um, other people's poems to see how they would look in mm. my, on my typewriter. Mm. Berrigan and I agreed about that. He used to teach that way. He used to tell his students, go home and type up, you know, Kerouac or something. And I, I did that to Williams. I typed a whole little book of all the short poems that oh, I liked. Yeah. And, and, you know, looked at them and thought about, you know, how he typed. And, and, you know, we saw the picture of his old machine, which is in his desk. And he'd pull it up. It had one of those things with, you know, the, the level comes up. And then he had a big, high typewriter, old Remington. And think, what, what did it mean to him when he saw his poems then in type? You know, like we all have that funny thing of it doesn't look right. And, and that space isn't right. Or, you know, whatever. I mean, Robert Duncan went further with that than any of us, where he mm. refused to have, after a while, have anything said except in his typescript. And I, I and people said, "Oh, that's precious" or something. But I understand. I mean, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to go that far, but I understand. You know, because it is weird. I mean, every time you have a book printed, it's different. Some a different typeface, different spacing, different sense of the book, the margins. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff is incredibly important. And, you know, I mean, well, I always set my margin on the typewriter a certain way. I have I have a funny Hermes typewriter that I've always used since the 60s that has one and a half spacing so that it's not, you know, like one, what do you call it, single line spacing is too crowded to me and two is too far away and I've gotten very used to this Ooh. one and a half spacing because yeah. I can also like correct it in, or add in between the lines without yeah. jostling the thing apart and uh, you know so you know you go to Williams I mean Williams is one of the guys maybe the guy in my generation that showed you how the poem was composed you know he would drop he, he would have an, an of on the end of the line <laughs> something that Creeley picked up on big time you know but you know, I thought, wow, you know, I never thought. And then I kept wondering, you know, how do you, how does he read it, you know, aloud? And then, of course, by the time I heard him, I mean, on records, he had already had a stroke. Yeah. And I don't think he read, although people told me that earlier he sort of read that way too, but I, I don't know. I mean, suppose Creeley had hundreds of tapes. I, I don't know what had happened. Just of Williams, including ones before the stroke. Mm. And he made he made a Library of Congress recording in the forties, I believe. Um, Creeley, yeah. Oh. No, no, William. Oh, William, yeah. Creeley had it. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I mean, the first time I heard Creeley read, I was amazed that it was so emotional. You know, that he had these breaks in his, in his emotional expression. That I, th I thought it was all invention. I mean, more like Williams, you know, like he, he wants to break after of, you know, but, but it was all kind of, you know, breathless in a funny way. You know, where he, he couldn't get to that next word and then he'd have to break. Like, oh my God, it's totally different. Yeah. You know, which is why it's good to hear some poets read. I think a lot of poets don't read really well. Uh, and probably, I, I always thought it was a shame that, you know, since the 60s, every poet has to give poetry readings. I mean, I think some would rather not and probably shouldn't. Mm. And I, I even include somebody like John Ashbery, who, mm. who read very, very well, but he read consistently in a way where you weren't given any extra feeling or sense of those poems. You, I don't know how you feel about them, but, you, you know, he just is very... On a very even and very mild, and you know, well, as I don't always think of those poems that way, mm. but you know, so anyway, not to criticize him, right, he's a great poet, but you know, some poets don't give you an extra thing when they read to you. I mean, some don't read well at all, even their own, but some do read well, like like Ashbury, but they don't give you a, an aha moment, you know, like, oh, that's what that line, you know, no. And then some, I mean, like Kerouac was brilliant. I mean, he was, he was it was music. Yeah. The whole thing was, you know, and the shame about him, of course, in that case was that he was so shy after, particularly after yeah. On the Road was published, that he couldn't. He didn't want to read in public, and he, mm. if he did, he had to be drunk enough that he couldn't sometimes articulate the way yeah. he normally could. But you listen to those records, I mean, oh man, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I used to have the experience of lending, I, I was like a Kerouac Boy Scout, you know, I was like, you gotta read this, you gotta read, and they take it away. And particularly not on the road. I mean, the books later, they had all the dashes. And they come back and they say, well, I don't understand how, how to read this. <laughs> I said, listen to this record. Right. Right. Then they would go, yeah. they had the aha uh -huh moment and go, oh, man, I want to read it. Now I know how to read it. Uh, so, listen, since, since you bring up the oral, I, I think that the reason, you know, you know I know in, in a funny way, Jack Hurstman would say, why do you like Ezra Dog? You know, he got that from uh, uh, he got that from uh, Pablo Neruda, who had a poem against Pound. You know? Oh yeah, he called and, Ezra Dog. And so I said to Jack, I said, you know, I heard those Cademan recordings uh -huh. that were done at St. Elizabeth's in 1957, and I said, nobody. Uh, up to that point in my life, I'm, I'm just 15 years old. I hear. The thought of what America would be like if the classics had a wide circulation troubles my sleep. I never heard anything like that. And then, and then there was Eliot. You know, uh, uh, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress. I like the way he said, instead of progress, a progress. So those guys, I said, don't you understand? Those people stayed with me. I didn't know from nothing about the guy's madness, you know, but they stayed with me. And incidentally, I just wrote a poem about Eliot's anti-Semitism, and I, I, I was angrier at him than I am at Pound. Hmm. Pound was mad. Eliot was a high-class intellectual guy taking the burden of the humanities with him into the 20th century, hmm. and yet he had this stupid anti-Semitism from his youth. Yes, he was a friend of Norbert Weiner at Harvard. He had other Jewish friends, but they were the select, the good Jews. Anyway, enough of that, but the idea of the oral. I know Oppen told me once, <clears throat> George Oppen said, I don't like to read in public. I don't like doing readings. Yeah, I'm not really, a good reader. Yeah, I don't have yeah, a good yeah. voice. Yeah, so. he was probably right. I never heard him read, but I, Lesser, yeah. um, I Speaking of those recordings of Pound, I was... <laughs> When we came back from Vancouver in 63, Michael Palmer and a bunch of us stayed at Ferlinghetti's house up on Potrero and because he and his wife were at the cabin down in Big Sur. 
and Alan was staying there. So Alan, of course, opened the door to all of us. You know, yeah. said, come on in, man. Mm. In fact, that's where I met McClure. Mm. He came over one day. And so anyway, the, we're going through Larry's library of rec LPs, and he had those two Cademan Pound records. Mm. And, put, and Alan said he'd never heard them before. And he put them on, and he couldn't believe the way he was you know, rolling his R's and sounding oh. like Bobby Burns or something. What the hell? I, I can't imagine. He's like shrieking. You know, I'm not, how, Pound doesn't sound like, how did, <laughs> I mean, I had heard them actually, but I was amazed that he never had. But why not? I mean, you know, he just wasn't, the, didn't know somebody that had them or something. And, and yeah, yeah, and if you hear the 57 recording at St. Elizabeth, which is very forceful, and then you hear 67, 10 years later at Spoleto. Oh, Mama Louie, what a difference. Mm -hmm. the, it's, the voice is so fragile and old, but every word is bathed. There's just no question. You, anyone can go on Penn Sound and they'll find old Ez reading uh, many of the cantos and other poems in that very, very old and fragile voice. I mean, there was no silence there. Hmm. There's no doubt he had went through a period of silence after he left the U.S. after St. Elizabeth, but but um, he certainly respected his own work, and he came to Spoleto twice to read, and Ferlinghetti wrote a poem about that. See, I said, see, I also told Hirschman, for those who don't like Pound or think we're selling out by loving Pound, the cover of one of the City Life's journals is Ezra Pound. You probably know that in Venice. Yeah. Uh, there's Lawrence's tribute to Pound about the Spoleto reading. He said, we're all on our tender hooks. And Pound gets up there. We're not sure he can do it. And within a minute or so, he had <laughs> taken over the entire room because people felt they were listening to literally to the whole history of poetry in, in, in that voice. You know, it's funny, I, thinking back to when I first knew about Pound and Elliot and Williams, uh, I was at Brown in uh, 56, 57, mm. and none of the English department, none of the professors ever talked about any of those people. Mm. It, was, it was not there. And, uh, you know, they would just say, well, Beckett, too. Oh. You know, I mean, Wade for Goto had been shown, and it was a you know, kind of, what do you call it, a, a sensation. And um, a friend of mine had a course in modern drama with this guy. And the guy, and then my friend asked him, what about this guy Beckett? And he said, well, I can't talk about him because there hasn't been enough critical material written <laughs> yet. And that, you know, and that was exactly true that, you know. Oh. And then later yeah. I realized how fortunate I was to have come to those guys at a time when there wasn't all that shit that I had to read right. first, you know, and that includes, of course, everybody after them, you know, all the great people we know. Uh, I mean, I remember talking with Barrett Watton about it, where he, we were talking about, the, there was a panel at Naropa about the new American poetry, you know, Donald Allen's anthology, mm -hmm. how important that was to a lot of us. And Barry said, where, I, I read that and then I thought, where is my generation where where are the people you guys had that and, and I didn't you know and I realized yeah I mean I read that anthology not knowing really much about any of those people I knew about Kerouac and Ginsburg Corso the New York guys I didn't know uh, you know guys like Joel Oppenheimer and, mm -hmm. and the guys out here I mean even you know Meltzer and Lamantia guys that I really loved later but I didn't know and I just I just felt I was just lucky, you know, that I hit. And not only that, I mean, the music too, you know, Ornette Coleman, Cecil Taylor, John Cage, oh, the yeah. painting, the cooning, Gustin, you know, I, I, I just ran my head right against all that stuff, you know, without anything in the way, you know, which is baffling sometimes. You know, it's, at first, maybe you don't even know whether you like it or not, but, you know, man, you're getting a first person shot, you know, right in the face. and. I, I, I don't. I remember talking to Steve Lacey, who was a wonderful uh, soprano sax player, who died a few years ago. Uh, he he said, 
he was interviewed on the radio one time, and, and the, the the woman said, "Where did you go to college?" Mm. And he said, "I went to the University of Birdland." And then he elaborated, and he said, "In the '50s, and I remember this because I've lived in, in New York in '58, '59. I used to, went to Birdland every Monday mm -hmm. night, sat in the peanut gallery, drank a ginger ale." You know. um, he said, in, "In the '50s, you could hear on any given night." The entire history of jazz, from J Jelly Roll Morton was oh. appearing to Cecil Taylor, oh, wow. everything in between Every, yeah. was there, you know. And he and they didn't kick it out after one set, and you know, and he could lean against the machine, the cigarette machine at the five spot for all night with a buck and a half beer and listen to Monk or, you know, all the amazing people that, that I now talk to younger people and they go, oh man, you were at that thing, you saw that, you, yeah, I mean, we took it for granted kind of, I mean, I, I must admit, but you couldn't really take it for granted because it was so sensational, you know, so what those guys were doing. Uh, uh, anyway, I wandered on, but I mean, the thing about Pound, you know, and, and Williams, I mean, you know, I, I remember, I used to say, I was against Eliot before I ever read him, hmm. because I was such a Williams guy, hmm. you know. Hmm. Then Williams was so anti-Wasteland, and he thought it ruined American poetry, so yeah. back how many decades, he said. And I, I, you know, I was ready to be there with him on that, you know, at the barricades, because I loved him so much, and I understood him, I thought. And I didn't even read Williams until I mean uh, Eliot. So years later, and mm. then I realized he was he was some kind of great poet. But but it wasn't right for me then wow. to have had to deal with that. I mean later I thought that Gus and I used to talk about how we love the four quartets. You know, but then I mean it's important that you be embattled and and you know say fuck you to people you didn't really know why you were saying it. <laughs> I mean, it's a horrible thing to confess politically, but it, it isn't really political. It's, it's, it's You know, I've thought about what you just said about yeah. El Williams and Eliot and Pound, because one of Williams' worst poems and a very negative poem is in the last year or two against Pound. They should give you a Nobel Prize. You deserve it. Sort of like, you asshole. Yeah, right. You know, and... and um, I think he was, this is selling him short in a way. I love Williams so much like you do. We, we all do. We just, it, he was so great. Incidentally, Harold Norris said, one day at the Cafe Trias, I was talking, there were a bunch of people around, and Norris and Raymond Foy, who was acting very refined, and, and Raymond said, stop slurring your words to me and ending your sentences, and they're trailing off nowhere. And Harold said, you know, whenever I visited Williams, he said one of the charming things about him was it was just like at the corner grocery store. He <laughs> had no airs to put on, and he would slur his words, yeah. and he, would, he read a poem. He said, what do you guys think of this? Is it any good? He was like <laughs> some beginner, you know. Yeah. But I think his thing with Eliot also had to do with it. Eliot got the kudos. And I know biographically that, that Williams... He did deserve more, but he felt he deserved more, and he wanted more. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that one of the last letters Ginsburg ever wrote uh, was to, I know all the dirty linen on these, Ginsburg wrote was to Bill Clinton asking him to help him get a Nobel Prize. So, you know, to, I think to that... To get? Oh, Cl um, uh, Alan wrote to Clinton asking him to, to get, help him get the Nobel Prize. I missed it again. To who should get the Nobel Prize? That Alan should. Alan, Alan wanted it. Yeah, yeah did not for oh. Williams. No, 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 no. And so I think Williams felt that about in competition with Eliot, and certainly with Pound, who was his old friend. And uh, I mean, he would visit him at the asylum, and he loved him. He would petition for him to get out. He loved him. You know him. who the? Well, you know because you we read the same book. The about same, it. yeah. But the first poet to go was Olson. To St. Elizabeth, because he lived in D.C. An amazing, yeah. and he was working for Roosevelt. He was, he was yeah. a political guy. Uh, but I, you brought up several things about Williams. I I keep thinking about Louis Zukowski, who was a dear man and a brilliant poet, and never got his due. Certainly, no, never. And when Michael Palmer and I met him, 
he was just beginning to give readings. I, I don't think he had ever given a reading in his life. Mm. And I think Paul Blackburn got him to read at the five spot of all places. He oh, God. Sit. Yeah, that's amazing. And Louis, maybe first reading was at the five spot. In, wow. In, in what, 60s, early 60s. So, you know, we, it was very, Louis was very generous to us and invited us to his house and all, over and over. We got talking about Williams, we got talking about anti-Semitism and Pound and all that. I mean, maybe I shouldn't even bring it up, but, it, but Louis okay. swore that he never felt a drop yeah. of anti-Semitism from Ezra. Uh, and uh, I have to believe him, you know, but that's that thing where you know somebody and so therefore that guy is not your enemy because you know him. But on the other hand, you can spew racist garbage, you know, like, well, I don't want to get into the mentality. Well, you know, it, it's okay. We both read the Bug House book, this book about, this guy wrote a very good book about Pound being incarcerated. And it turned out that Clark and I, a few months ago, had both read the book. But, you know, like George Oppen told me very clearly, he was at, I think I might have mentioned this to you, and I think he's written about it. He was at the New Directions office when Pound had visited the U.S. in 71. They were with James Laughlin. And Ezra Pound is sitting in a chair, and Oppen's on the other side of the room. And Laughlin said to Pound, George would like to say hello to you. And Pound turned up. Laughlin said, no, he doesn't want to speak to me. And Oppen came over and grabbed his hand, and they both had tears in their eyes. Because hmm. Oppen did want to see Pound. I mean, Pound wrote the, the uh, preface right. to his right. uh, to Discreet series yes. in 34, his first book. So yes, and I've heard that Zukowski thing as well. But Zukowski also told me of an incident where I think and Pound was already in St. Elizabeth, and I think they gave him the Bollinger Prize, or they or they didn't give it to him. Like, did mm. they give Pound the Bollinger Prize? Yes, they did, they but did. before he went in, he was before, on his was way before, in. Oh, no, it was while he was in, 46. Yeah, 47. somebody pr proselytized for that. I, I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Uh, who, who, no, I don't know who it was. It was um, Al's, um, oh, fuck, um, the, the guy who wrote... Fuck, I, my memory's getting... I'm both yeah. uh, The guy who wrote J.B., you know, that poet, the play about Job. Oh, and Archibald McLeish. Archibald McLeish. I think he was, they didn't have a poet lawyer then, but they had an advisor to the Library, Library of Congress. Yeah. And I believe that he pushed hard for Pound to, I mean, strange as it may seem. But anyway, so there was publicity that got back on Williams and Rutherford. New Jersey, because people knew, reporters came up to him and said, you know this guy who was, did these hateful, traitorous acts, you know, and Williams had to deal with that. I mean, he, you know, he hadn't really been in touch with Pound for, I mean, he may have gone to St. Louis once or twice. Anyway, he was on one of those Mike Wallace kind of TV shows with mm. the glaring lights like, like the yeah, cops, right. <laughs> you know, and, and Wallace or whoever it was put it to him, you know, here's Williams. What do you say about this guy? This guy is a known anti-Semite. He's an he's an anti-American. He's blah. You imagine this guy in the glaring sweat, you know. And Williams <laughs> is trying to be nice and not, and he comes out with that phrase, you know. Some of my best friends are Jews, like Louis Zukowski. He says that on nationwide television. Right. And Louis was watching it, and he said, "I understood, you know. I mean, I love Williams, you know. I I." God, I, I felt for the poor guy. He's under the fucking heat lamp. Right. He said the next day, Williams knocked on his door in tears and said, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was a great book because these controversies never end. And um, uh, what happened with me with Elliot was a few weeks ago, I hadn't picked up the collected poems for a long time, and I got fascinated with the idea that there's the section called Occasional Verses, there's the section called Minor Poems, and there's a section called Unfinished Poems. Now, who else had, had ever done anything like that, you know? I'm putting together my collected poems, so I have the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, the Hollow Man, uh, aerial poems, this one and that, and choruses of the rock, and suddenly I put in occasional verses, and they are. There's a poem to to um, um, his wife, uh, 
there's a poem to a fellow poet who, who turned 70, and there's a poem in defense of the islands, then the unfinished poems, and uh, I, I thought that was interesting, and I thought it was sort of very practical and in a sense rather vain. I'm not sure, you know, unfinished poems. Well, they still haven't published all those obscene poems that he wrote, you know, about the black king of Africa. And oh, yeah. So the key and, I think he and Pound exchanged, I mean, they weren't meant to be seen, I guess, but, yeah. but we all kind of found out about them and, at some point, you know. But how do you uh, think, of, what do you think of the minor poems? These are my minor poems. I don't think that way. I can't possibly... <clears throat> I, I, I tried to get into it. I'm trying to understand it. You know, I like the unfinished. I like that. I like that idea. I always tell people, I, if I like somebody, I want to read every fucking yeah. word they wrote. I don't care if it's good, bad, terrific, impossibly great, nowhere. You know, I mean, like Kerouac, I used to defend that way because people would say, well, eh, now this all minor stuff is leaking out. I, said, I don't care, man. I want I, the stuff that's still not come out yeah. that I still demand to see, you know. But there's a lot of poems I know that aren't published. Well, there's a um, lot of beat poets. You and I have talked about this. Yeah. There's, there's several beat poets who are not published in, in any major way. Uh, Ray Bremser is one. Yeah. And then there's Danny Proper, whose work I love. And so I think, what's a major, what's a minor, what's a major poet, what's a minor, oh, hey, Vazemir, it's too much for me. And um, well, those, uh, those are the people that keep the score, you know, we're, yeah. not, we're not those people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's yeah. infuriating because that attitude gets out in public a lot more than any thing that we might come out with, and, yeah. if anybody ever asks us. And, so it's, <clears throat> all of that is really uh, interesting. What about the, um, you do listen to a lot of jazz while you're writing? I do, yeah. yeah. I can't, it's funny, you know, I love vocals too, yeah. but I can't write with vocals. Yeah. Wow. It, has to, it has to be instrumental, because the vocal will take me somewhere verbally that I don't want. It's too yeah. much, you know. Right. But instrumental jazz, I... I have. I mean, I can even do it without. I do it obviously. But the beat yeah. is in my brain anyway. But uh, yeah, I, that's another habit, uh, almost an addiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to keep. Uh, well, I like that idea that you that you surround yourself with all these books when you write. I know David. I mean, David's place was a library, oh, right? Yeah. It was a damn library. We had a kind of scholarship aspect to him. I mean, the whole Kabbalah thing, and something that I, I, of course, didn't share with him because I didn't have that background, but I know it was a very heavy interest. Uh, and he put out anthologies and things that had to do with that writing. Hey, he did a lot of Kabbalah stuff, that's right, a lot of, a lot of really obscure I mean, Jewish texts. Kind of yeah. That. Um, yeah, and Jack did that great Black Olives in the in the sixties, that book, uh, a collection of his, and, and of course they were both close to Wallace Berman, Berman who, who did that, those iconic uh, figures with the oh, with the Hebrew of course, letters. Of course, I, I used to always ask David about Berman over and over again, and he could never really tell me what I wanted to know. Yeah, and I kind of, and now I I understand in a way, but I was always fascinated with that guy because. When Michael and, uh, Michael Power and I had Joggler's magazine, we sent we got this mailing list probably from Creeley. Or it's, I mean, it's amazing how small the group was. Oh yeah. You had maybe twenty, thirty names that you wanted to receive this, and it wasn't even that we were publishing ourselves yet. It was it was this kind of we had Zukowski and all these guys, and one of the and of course those who had magazines that we sent to would often send their magazine back. I got the, what turned out to be the last issue of Semina. Oh, God. Which is that little envelope with a yeah. little McClure Dallas Wonderful. thing. Wonderful, yeah. And, it, and Wallace, he'd written on it, um, thanks for Joggler's cool selection, mm -hmm. W. Berman. I mean, it's, it's a pre treasure to me. I, yeah. mean, I always loved that, his concept of that magazine, an envelope of separate things, you know, drawings and poems and different typefaces. 
So, so I'd always ask David because I knew David arrived in L.A. as a teenager, you know, from the East, I believe with his father, who had a job in Hollywood somehow, I think writing scripts or something like that. And David was like thrown into L.A. and I think he went to, what do they call it, City College there too. It was L.A. something. Anyway, he said he, he lasted maybe six months. And then he started <laughs> meeting people. You know, hanging out, and he met Berman. Yeah. And through Berman, of course, he met all these other guys that were important to him. You know, Bob Alexander and and uh, her, uh, uh, George Herms, and you know some that are still alive actually. Uh, and I, you know, I knew Berman was like a jazz nut. He would always go to Central Avenue. Totally. And, yeah. You know, love guys like Dexter Gordon and, and so on. And I, I, I wanted to get it out of David. It's something you can't have. Finally. You know, mm -hmm. what was it like, what would it have been like, what I was really asking, what would it have been like if I had been there, you know, with you, or even instead of you, but with you? Do you think I would have, and David would always say, man, you would have been part of Wally's crowd. You definitely mm -hmm. would have been. But that's all he could tell me. Mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, Interesting, yeah. Because I always wanted, you know, like we all do, some incredible flash anecdote or, you know, one day Wally did this or right. something. But it's not like that, you know. It's, uh, he probably didn't even remember by that time. It's late in his life. and uh, I know there's a lot of grief over his early death and, you know, he, he still kept in touch with the Well, I don't know. Do you have that, the big anthology of a seminar that, uh, that was done? Big yeah. hardback? I mean, that's, yeah. it, 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 you know, because Berman was sort of was a lightning rod for so many people, right? Writers and artists, and right, right. in that great, grand, uh, grim geography of Los Angeles, it's so different than New York or San Francisco. Right. It's not compact, and there might be a great restaurant, but it's next to a laundromat and a parking lot, and so it, it's kind of a whole different vibe. And Berman was able to handle it. Jack did for a little Hirschman. Kirby Doyle went down there for a while. But there wasn't really a poetry scene no, the way New York. I mean, there were people lived in Venice or wherever. And, you they know, were isolated. Sort of, and, you know, and Perkoff. By the, I mean, there's another guy. Stewart yeah. was very close How to Berman. How about his work? And, yeah. You know, I used to, he, yeah. He really had a lot of, you know, like Paul Vangelisti loved mm -hmm. Berman. And, and then there was a poet, John Thomas, do you know? He wrote, a, he wrote a great poem about visiting Pound, because he visited Pound. He started up back east, came out west, went to L.A. and spent 40 years there. Um, but, but the L.A. scene that I knew was around Bukowski, and then there were all these people like me, younger poets, all around. And we would get together now and then, but we were isolated. We didn't have a coffee shop. Mm. We didn't have even one place to go. We had other people's houses. And there was this Papa Bach bookstore that opened, but that's way over here, and it's hard to get there. Oh, it's so spread. Yeah, and all these things, you know, and Berman was able to, for a time, galvanize a lot of people, some even, as you know, from the Hollywood community. Yes. So it, yeah. it, they got from, from Hollywood, they got from the poetry, from art, and... Uh, well, that's the thing I used to ask David, too. How come so many of those child stars ended up in Berman's crowd. You know, a number of them who, who never made the transition, really. I mean, there's Stockwell and Hopper, but uh, yeah. a lot of those guys died young from junk and, you know, bad life. Uh, why were they all attracted to Berman? How did that... And it has to be... A, somebody had to introduce somebody to somebody. You know, Hirschman, you know, like, Hirschman talked yeah. about his friend, oh my God, what's his... I don't know who he's... He's about Jack's age now in his 80s. He's a child, he was a young star, and Jack was saying that, that always all, he wanted to write, you know, he wanted to be a writer, and I think a lot of those Hollywood, you know, it's so close, acting, poetry, painting, whatever, I think it, I think it's a, a natural thing, really, you know, and, you know, they were touched by the glamour of Hollywood, yeah. But but they love the creativity of the artists and poets. I think, I mean Jack sort of, uh, uh, Tamblin, Russ Tamblin, Russ Tamblin yeah. who I met only because of Jack a couple of years ago, and I I think right. he's a was a friend of David's too, yeah, but he yeah. sort of fits that. Right. Um, he was there. But his daughter is a poet, and yeah. and he crazy about Jack, 
You know, him and his wife, just absolutely crazy. I wondered if some of it had to do with that terrible transition that those kids had to go through. You know, there weren't very many, like Hopper, or, or even Hopper, of course, had a hard time. And, yeah. And Stockwell had, pretty, had a pretty consistent career, but he had, they all had that moment when they, they left their teenage years, they weren't child stars, and they were pretty much dumped yeah. by Hollywood, and, unless they were able to come back as adults in some did, but a lot of them didn't, and yeah. maybe maybe they're all looking for something. It's a it's a rarefied you know. field, and you know I mean I'm also fascinated by when you start to think about, you know where poets come from, and and the whole idea of geography. You know, like I think mm -hmm. Edward Field did a geography of poets, oh, yeah. by cities, and you know um, I go out to Colorado and find us all kinds of poets. I end up having a press. Uh, doing my work in, in, in a little town in Colorado. Um, Kyle here comes from Omaha and lives now in, uh, in um, Fruta, Colorado, so even on the city council. And, you know, it's like, like uh, where does uh, Alice Notley come from? Needles, California, Needles, yeah. middle of the desert, <laughs> 24,000 people. Hottest place in the universe. Yeah, I was there once at <laughs> four in the morning. It was 105 degrees, and and uh, you're from Providence, right? And, and Bergen you know, was from Providence. And Bergen from Providence, and mm -hmm. but but obviously people from obviously people come from all over, which leads me to where was Ezra Pound born in Haley, Idaho? Yeah, in 1885, it was still the frontier. Hmm. You know, it, it was still the frontier, America. And his father was an essayist. You know, you don't have to grow up in St. Louis like, like a T.S. Eliot or whatever, you know. Or Burroughs. <laughs> or Burroughs, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Where do you come from, you know. Yeah. And on the other hand, it seems like Allen, it seems like Ginsburg, it seems like he could have been born in anywhere but New Jersey. <laughs> or Williams. I mean, Williams yeah. born pretty much stayed there his whole life. William Carlos Williams, yeah. Yeah, one Amazing. of the few, I think, that... One of the few that one didn't have a college job, and yeah. two stayed in his state. You know, um, now, what kept what kept you away from academia? My, probably my family. That I grew up I used to call us faculty brats. <laughs> you know, I knew all the inside shit yeah. <laughs> about the music department and everything since I was tiny, and my father, who was one of these. You know, old Yankee, proper, you know, pleasant guys who I don't think I ever saw without a tie and a jacket. Wow. You know, and he believed in the, the being pleasant and ah. proper. And, you know, I wasn't particularly religious, but, you know, uh, he had to, he started the music department there and he had to deal with all these guys, who, some of whom, there was one guy, I won't mention names, but, uh, whose wife committed suicide wow. because he was fucking a, a oh. student. This was back in the, the 50s, yeah. you know. My, I'm trying, my father, every day dealing with, I couldn't imagine my father doing it. He did it. But it's one of those ma magical mysteries, you know. How did he handle it, you know. And I know lots of stories like that. So, you know, I, was, I wasn't convinced. I just went to Brown because friends of mine like Alvin Kerr and, who I'd been in high school and mm. with, went there, and it was probably the easiest thing to do. And I shouldn't have been there at all. I, I didn't take it seriously. Uh, ah. but I actually had been, the only other place I was accepted was the Colorado School of Mines, <laughs> because uh, I wanted to be a geologist. The geology, yeah. but, but then when a friend of mine went to MIT, who was much more adept at math and stuff and had a horrible time, I said, I would have flunked out immediately. You know, I, would, I wouldn't have been there two years. <laughs> but I think it was that and that I really shouldn't have been in college anyway because all I ever did there was read the stuff I wanted to read, play jazz, play pool, get drunk, start to get high. The little pot was filtering in in the 50s or mid-50s, even in Ivy League. School. But what about teaching later in life? You didn't think of that? I, like... I didn't want to... You know, you know Mr. Coolidge, we'd love to have you for three months yeah, or whatever. I, I mean, they, I kind of, you know, I was at Naropa early where they did, you know, more than a few weeks. 
And then I actually did teach, the most teaching I ever did at once was a, a winter semester there, uh, which is crazy and funny and great in a way, because they had no heat in the building. And we were all, we're all sitting there with overcoats and smoking millions of cigarettes and <laughs> trying to stay awake. And, but anyway, uh, no, I, I, it must have occurred to me early, and it probably had something to do with the fact that I was realizing I wasn't going to be a career geologist and not going to be a career <laughs> scientist, because I knew what I wanted was a romantic image which didn't exist. You know, I would be out in the Gobi Desert with a mineral pick, you know, finding uh, you know, crystals and geo, yeah. you know, that climbing and going caves. Wow. That's what I wanted to do and what I did as a kid. But there was no career there. You know, and I remember at junior high they made us do these things called career books where you had to clip out stuff, you know, showing things right. about your projected career. And I didn't know at that point, what do you mean career? I don't, I'm a kid. I don't want, <laughs> you know, it's like Gene Shepard. Did you ever hear Gene Shepard? He would, he would always say, yeah, I'm just this kid, you know, <laughs> I don't know, you know. But that was the attitude then. And I had to go through a couple of years of actually my major in geology to realize that, that the thing, and then when I really got into poetry, I realized what I liked about minerals was the names of the minerals and the actual physical mm. crystals, the difference in the weight, the way light affected them, passed through them, the names, I mean, weird names like appetite, which is not spelled mm. like, like uh, yeah. you know, appetite. Um, so somewhere I got a hint, and then when I got into to writing, I, I could just couldn't imagine spending all that time really explicating. You know, I don't think that's what poets ought to do. I mean, I don't like to proselytize, uh, criticize people that way, but I mean, that's not what a poet does. And if you spend a lot of time talking about poems, you know, and how to do it and how not to do it, and you're telling, you know, fresh faces that come in every year. I, and then you're complaining. I know so many poets, I'm not writing so much anymore, you know. Why is that? And I said, well, well you know why. Because your, your mind is being spent in that other room, that other space, which is all about explication, not creation. Mm. And it's, it seems very simple, but I, it is. But maybe some people don't have that really enough. Mm. They have. To, I mean, even somebody like Creeley, he loved talking to to young people in classes. Mm. It didn't seem to prevent him from writing a lot of poems. But he, wow. did, he did write short poems mainly. Yeah. And I've seen his notebooks. You know, he'd write a whole poem one page, turn the page, yeah. write another poem. You know, uh, and he had to have that. He had to have that talk. Thing it was almost too much. I mean, when I first met him, he he talked so much and so abstractly that none of us could really understand him. But he, but he was obviously high on it. You know, he's like, man. I remember one it seemed like a whole evening we we got high and we were talking about about uh, what what is the word? No, I've forgotten. Um, if you walk down the street impeccably. Impeccable. He got hung up on the word impeccable. <laughs> and of course, we got into it from if you were impeccable and you're smoking a joint walking down the street, you could get away with it. If you did that impeccably. You know, and actually, I remember being, it was so high, I, I sort of went, what is that? Well, I don't know that word. I mean, I did know it, but I, I was looking at it different. I'm like, <laughs> what would that mean to be absolutely impeccable? You know, I think I thought it meant like being some British count or something. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Like like yeah. noble or something. You're you're impeccable, and you had the right clothes, and you had the right look. And I mean, no, no, no. Bob wasn't talking about that. <laughs> well, know. that's interesting. I was thinking of when you when you when you're saying that. I'm thinking of Ezra Pound, who always dressed like a bohemian. Oh, he was a bohemian, you know, the baronic, even as an old man, baronic collar, and even if he dressed up, it was like bohemian. Like, and T.S. Eliot, who was impeccable, <laughs> an impeccable dresser, he was like a yeah, real banker, you know, and that's not a put down, it just was impeccable. Makes so I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm going to start with this, mm -hmm. is that I have, since I ran an MFA program, I feel a little guilty. I remember how much the students had to pay. And it was a prose program, and they were in it for success. 
And I remember telling him, I said, boy, you've come to the wrong place with me because I don't really like that altar. And uh, I tried to explain what I meant to them. And then I had David teach for one semester and half of them loved him and half of them didn't because he's even more out, far out than I am on that, I think. But I have a strange, maybe it's not a strange, sort of have a problem. You know, it's fine people are becoming writers instead of MBAs, business. So many. But I it's just know. too much to me. And, and yeah. now there's the doctorate in creative writing. So I don't know if you have any take on that or, you know. Well, I, I saw that all happen in the 60s, you know, the, 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 the workshops. Yeah. Uh, and as I said before, when we had our little magazine, there were maybe 20, 30 people who mostly were poets or and or editors of their own magazines right. that we wanted to have our magazine. You know, and even before we put our own poems in our magazine, we, we just wanted to be part participant in that mm. scene. And we had already met, I mean, the reason Michael and I went to Vancouver, we used to go, he was at Harvard, I was in Providence, but I used to drive up to Cambridge to go to the bookstores. And one of the, the great poetry bookstores, the Grolier bookstore. Oh, wow. And uh, old, what's his name? I forget the guy's name that ran it. Um, it at two separate occasions, Michael and I both went through the same physical act of the prospectus for the course at Vancouver fell down behind a bookcase in this guy's store, and we each, unknown to each other, helped Gordon Kearney, was his name, lift this thing up and put it back, and of course read it and saw mm. all those names and went, holy shit, we have to be there, you know, mm. immediately applied. And later, we, Michael and I laughed over this and that we did the same thing, you know. But then it was, you know, Olson Creeley, Ginsburg, Whalen, Duncan. Those were the guys, you know, there weren't too many other poets that we really that interested in meeting. We wanted to meet them, you know. We wanted to see, you know, as somebody said, you know, what it was like to be a poet, or if you could be a poet in this culture. If you, you know, and Creeley, of course, at that point was like, having a terrible time with Bobby there breaking up and, and you know, he was all like, oh man, you know, he jumped on some, he had taught the year before at the University of British Columbia and hated it, it was a very stuffy place actually. And he had jumped on one of the professors, you know, at a party, drunk and started choking him. And a bunch of us had Bobby and oh. pulled Bob off, and he's yelling, at goddamn social fucking, you know, oh. he, he'd go mad. You know, he had to, Warren Tolman had convinced him to come back to do this summer. If it hadn't been for that, I don't think he would have ever seen yeah. the place again. So anyway, that's one of the guys that we wanted to meet, and we were meeting him in the middle of a turmoil, a personal head problem and that was part of you know and then Alan who had just literally come back from India you know in his, his linen pajamas and the oiled hair oh, yeah. and uh, and the Hare Krishna uh. mantra I remember <laughs> sitting in, in Warren Tolman's uh. living room with Phil Whalen a bunch of guys and Alan is teaching us Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna probably for the first time in America you know not that I'm crazy about any of that but I mean historical moment you know, which is very important to Alan, you know, was, <laughs> I'm sure Alan could have told you the day and the address of Warren Tolman, the day he brought yeah. that to America, you know, it wasn't even America, it was Canada, mm. but I mean, you know, and mostly Canadians in that class, actually, but, um, was that the 1963 Vancouver? 63 Vancouver, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Which was actually, a, they call it a conference, but actually it was a class. It was a class in the summer school. It had a number. And it was, it was a riot when we, when we left to cross back into, into the States. Uh, one of the kids in the class had been busted by the Mounties mm. at, in the cafeteria for mm. pot. And these guys dressed like Sergeant Preston. You know, the, the, as kids, we, that's the only thing we knew about Mounties. We, we couldn't take it seriously, you know red blue pants and everything and they're hauling this kid out you know and so no no man and the, the, the Canadians would say those guys are cops man you think they're they're music hall comedians but they're fucking cops they they're just like your cops <laughs> you've just seen what they do you know so anyway when we all drove 
back into the States, we were worried about having any dual on us. So the car I went in with Michael and mm. his friend Tom Webster and maybe three other people we were scrupulously clean. Alan went through with Phil and, and a po another poet, I uh, think it was another guy that has vanished, uh, wrote a good peyote poem, actually, I remember. Um, they, they came through with all kinds of dope and scraggy beards and Meh. everything. And the guy asked them, where are you coming from? Well, we've been hunting up in the mountains. <laughs> so, all right, get out. Ah, there. good. Yeah. But we, in the other car, got pulled up. We, the guy said, where are you coming from? You'd be, you know, what class were you in? We told him the number. He said, pull over. They were waiting for us. And they stripped that car. I mean, they they found nothing because we were warned. But, but man, you know, this is the American side, obviously, mm. not, not the Canadians. Uh, so, you know, but that was, uh, it was a course. And sometimes the students from other classes would, would come to us in the, in the cafeteria for lunch and say, I'm writing a paper on schizophrenia. Mm. I understand that you, your teacher is Allen Ginsberg. Is he a schizophrenic? You know, is he, is he crazy, you know? And we were like, what, you know? Get away from me, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, sometimes I have thought, actually, that Allen Ginsberg is one of the sanest people I've ever met. I mean, really, really. I've seen him in situations, I mean, I mean all kinds of things where I, I was aghast at his ability to, all the way from, you know, some kid coming up going, hey, I, Alan, man, you remember in 19-whatever, yeah. you know, we had this great time, and, you know, and he was able to say to that kid, no, I actually don't remember, <laughs> but, you know, if you didn't say something or do something that would make me remember, I won't. but then he would spend time with this kid, and he would actually bring the kid off from this yeah. bad scene. You know, and yeah. so the kid actually then felt like, I, oh, I did meet Allen Ginsberg, and he was great. You know, but you know, one one time I love this story. But it's um, one time at Naropa, Alan in the afternoon came and he came in my room. I was next door to him with a varsity town. Hey Clark, you got to come with me. This girl at at CU has got this thing <laughs> going in the planetarium. She's got this incredible show, and she's got this tenor player. I mean, Alan would always like earmark your interest, you know. He said, this, he's got this great tenor player, you gotta hear him. So, I said, okay, and he went to McClure, too, who was that? So, oh, this is, she's a great playwright, she's right, you gotta come. So we all went, and we came a little late, and you know, planetarium, you've been in a planetarium, mm -hmm. dark. And everybody's in the seat, so we can't find seats, so we get lost from each other. And we find, and it was it was awful. It was it was really really bad. It was some girl, you know, showing slides of her mother and her sister on the ceiling of the planetarium. And the tenor man was like passed out. <laughs> I don't think he ever played anything. Right. right. And, and so when we, when it was over, we Michael and McClure and Al and I found each other, and McClure was righteously pissed at Alan. He said, why did you waste my time with that shit? You know, come on, you, you know, you should have known better. And I, I'm just kind of watching this because I, <laughs> I mean, it's all, it's all an experience to me. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to complain to Alan because this, you know, he probably didn't know. He just thought, you know, this sounds interesting. Yeah. And you take a look. Sure. And before I knew it, and then Alan got in this down mood, you know, like doubtful, which he would get, you know, mm. when that whole Merwin thing happened. In the oh film, yeah, he was Alan was like, well, should, maybe I shouldn't have, you know, maybe it's my fault, and you know that kind of thing. So anyway, after the planetarium, we're walking along, and Michael is just blown a stack at Alan. Alan turns to me. I swear this is true. He looks me in the eye and says, "Do you think I should have written Caddish?" Mm. You know, because this girl is doing this confessional. Yeah. Thing. And I could, you know, you can imagine, I was blown away. I couldn't imagine Alan Ginsberg is asking me if he should have written Caddish. <laughs> come on. And I probably blurred out, I don't know, no, no, I don't. Come on, it's a great poem, don't worry about it. But he was, you know, he would ask whoever was there, 
You know, what did you think? You know, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Maybe the whole thing is, which we all feel, you know, at times. No, he was, he's and, vulnerable in, in many ways. Yeah, and yeah. I'll, I'll say a couple things about Alan, if I may. Is that yeah. When we first met, <clears throat> it's in my book, Witten's Wild Children. First thing Alan Ginsberg said to me was, you're fat. And I said, and you're bald. And things were never the same with us since. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing. And then another thing was, um, Alan, um, when, when Alan would come into town, I noticed if I didn't show up at a reading, I'd have a phone call as, where are you? It's Alan Ginsberg. Whereas when I'm, in, when I'm there before him, I don't exist. So I thought that was interesting. That, that was another thing with Alan. And then one of the charming things was he would talk to anybody about very serious subjects. Yeah, I had a <clears throat> seven, 18, excuse me, 18 year old, <laughs> knock on wood, boyfriend from Guatemala and Alan and him got into it on Guatemala and Central America and Alan did his homework. Alan read the papers all the time and, and Isai and Alan had this incredible talk in Isai's broken English, Alan's teeny bit of Spanish, they really got some things going. Then one night, this is the bad Alan maybe, I got a call from Alan and he said, I'm down at the Savoy Tivoli, this is in North Beach, open air cafe, and I want to talk to you about something. Can you meet me tomorrow night at 8? And I said, yes. I got off the phone and I immediately thought he was going to get me published with New Directions or City Light, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy and I could hardly sleep. Mm -hmm. and I came by the next night and he sitting there and he ordered us each a cappuccino and he said, you're a Californian, right? He said, I'd like you to consider signing papers to have Gregory Corso committed for two weeks observation. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is really heavy. And I wanted to say, you've got to be kidding, but I said something which I know was right. To, I said, we're going to have to talk to Lawrence about this. And Alan says, oh, you're right, you're right. And it was never brought up again, but but he did say, you know, he was going on about how Gregory was acting. So was that terrible. remember when Gregory was st huh? stealing from the till, the City Lights? At City Lights? Yeah, I remember that. Well, That's Gregory, I was with Gregory that evening, and Gregory... I mean, was that at the time of this? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was right before that, actually. That's true. Mm -hmm. Gregory went up to the store, and he put a rock through the window, came in, he took a couple hundred dollars out of the register, and fled the city with Lisa Brinker, my old girlfriend, who was with him then. And about six in the morning, I got a phone call. It was the, it's a comical thing. It was Joe Wahlberg, who was the manager. He said, well, you were with Gregory last night, right? I said, yeah. And he said, were you with him when he robbed the store? I said, no, what's this? And he told me the story. And then about 15 minutes later, it was Nancy Peters, the, uh, the uh, assistant to Lauren. And he leaves, this is Nancy. You were with Gregory last night? When he and I, I explained, mm -hmm. no, I had gone home. And then about 15 ma later, minutes later, hi, Neely, this is Lawrence. What did Gregory do to us? <laughs> he stole all this money out of the till and he left. Were you with him? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I already told Joe and Nancy. So that was my participation in the great caper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was one of the reasons, it's true, that's one of the reasons Alan was beside himself. And Alan felt like Gregory's father. They had, they had met in 1950 in a bar. And of course, and, he, had, he had terrible trouble with Gregory, too. And he had, you know, he, he I saw it. I, and, yeah, yeah, and I've seen him shake him down and this and that. And, mm -hmm. you know, the discombobulated beats. Uh, that's an old story, so... That book, by the way, just so you know, was very influenced by Bernadette Mayer. Oh, okay. She and I were very close mm -hmm. in those years in the 70s. And she had just really seriously started to write. I mean, she almost went in a kind of hippie political direction, but she, I saw work by her and I always encouraged her. And then she, she couldn't stop writing. I mean, she mm. think I write a lot. I mean, she wrote, you know, so we got into this thing of doing this collaborative work, which was about the right. visit to this cave, which finally got published a few years ago. Um, and, and we did that through the mail, but then we see each other and we talk about it. And at the same time, I was writing Book Beginning, and she was writing what later got published as Studying Hunger Journals. 
which, uh, yeah. you know, what's the name press? Uh, it was George Quash's press, I've forgotten the name, published me. <laughs> uh, it's terrible the way the memory goes. But, but anyway, so we were writing kind of similar prose-ish kind of long things. And we, and we always had kind of a semi-humorous nudging of each other about writing long and reading long. We, we mm. didn't like the idea that you got up, you know, with another poet and, re and read for 20 minutes or 40 minutes and you're done. You should, you know, go on for hours, you know. And of course, and we tried to do that and I'm sure it bored the piss out of a lot of people <laughs> and didn't get asked back and things like that. But finally, I remember the Paula, Paula Cooper, one of the big galleries in New York, mm -hmm. uh, had, a, had oh, yeah. a new gallery downtown with no, with just pillows. You know, and I read, I think I read the whole, I'd written that long book called Polaroid, and I read the whole thing. Wow. And people fell asleep, <laughs> and Bernadette wrote during, and got accused, we used to laugh about this, somebody accused her of being rude to me, mm. because she was writing while I was reading, and, and she yeah. and I said, man, that's the greatest thing I can imagine. That's a you know? great thing. You know, somebody would be inspired. I agree. You know, so, uh, you know, we both got to read long there, but that was kind of a special situation. And then we also did videos that um, yeah. her boyfriend Ed Bowes um, at the time um, was a great video guy. And uh, we made three half hour videos of us reading and walking, doing things in my house in the Berkshires and then in his, their uh, loft in, in New York. Um, and those are lost, by the way. Nobody knows what happened to them. And we showed those. We showed those as a reading at St. Mark's, the Poetry Project, and mm. people complained about that. What do you mean you're not going to read? So, well, yeah, but the, we're going to show you this. Nobody's ever seen these great <laughs> videos. <laughs> so there was no winning, but but it drove us together in an interesting way. You know, yeah. We're kind of battled against the usual shit and. Kyle, Kyle was uh, talking about your seven hours at uh, the se seven nights. Two hours. Seven nights, I mean, here, at the Langdon, yeah. right? And that you wanted to, you wanted to do something like that at uh, Lithic. at Lithic. But that was, you were reading from from that book, a book beginning what the, the whole thing. thing. It didn't have a title then, but the, the, I had all these pages, and I thought of it. It's funny because I remember arguing with some of the language guys. Um, because they thought of it as like a conceptual work. Mm. I said, no, man, I'm, I'm like a jazz musician, <laughs> and I play in this club seven nights, and if you can't make it Tuesday, maybe make it Friday. You know, I really thought of it that way, and I have all this work, so why not fucking read it, you know? And, How um, old were you then when you did that? Oh, that was, when was that? Late 70s, I guess? I, I would have been what? Uh, Late 20s, something like that. I feel like I read that it was, was 79. Think of the think of the energy it would yeah the energy it would take. I mean I would be dead if I tried. Well, I did in three in two sets each night. Yeah. Read for about an hour, take a break, and do another. Yeah. And those tapes appear to be lost. I mean that was all taped, and I tracked down the guy who was there, and he's now at Davis, and he doesn't remember what happened. And, uh, yeah. You know, if you don't watch out, that stuff like vanishes. A lot of that, yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff was stolen, actually, out of the, the Poetry Project office, all the, when, the, when it was all those little cassettes, you know. So you don't and have that, a tape of that? Or you, of what? Of my that, that reading? That reading, that, no. It ain't, uh, no. Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll have to come to Lithic and do it again in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, Lithic Bookstore in Little Fruit, the, this big poetry Fruit. bookstore oh, with yeah. a photo of Jack Spicer on the door. I mean, it's just wow. amazing. Yeah. God. And they've done about 30 books, right? Something like that. Things you yeah. don't know about. Bruce Ackley told me yesterday there's been this jazz festival in a place called Potter Valley. Mm. I've heard of that. You know where this way up near Ukiah and oh, Willits and yeah. up there. This rich guy has been doing for 20 years, and, and it's guys like Rova. I mean, that's sort of more far out guys, and this guy loves them, and it's free. And they pay incredibly well because this guy's oh. wealthy, and he likes to have the musicians. You gonna go up there and play? I, hmm, you gonna go up there and play? I, well, I'm gonna go up there. I mean, I didn't even know about it till yesterday. Evidently, he never publicizes it, and you know, I remember there was a, a guy named Gibson or something in Denver that had his jazz party every year mm. in a hotel, 
another wealthy guy, and he just, it was sort of mainstream stuff, but he wanted those guys around him, you know, Zoot Sims and guys like that. And finally some of that got recorded and released, so people knew about it, but this guy never. He evidently doesn't, it's not like he's secret or something, he just didn't, you know, if you hear about it, great, you can call him. You know, and we'll kick wow. it out. But, you, so there, there are things like that, you know, yeah. like the bookstore you mentioned. And, uh, you know, Have you ever incorporated jazz or or drums or music in general into live performance? <laughs> That's Alan. Well, Alan used to challenge me on that and say, you know, you first of all, you you always talk about improvisation. How come you just don't get up without mm. any text and just blow? And, mm. and I remember arguing, and I finally said to him, sort of in humor, sort of serious. So I won't end up with stupid end rhymes like you do. Mm. And he laughed and he said, "Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> you know, I can't think of anything. That, that's what those end rhymes are for. You know, kind of. <laughs> you know, I mean, he what did he, he and Kenneth Cope did a thing at St. Mark's once of making up, just bowling on and on mm. with, with rhymes and yeah. silly, you know, dog roll poems and. Is that you? you know, but it, but what you actually asked me, I can't figure a way logistically to be playing the drums and reading. You know, I would almost have to memorize it, which I couldn't do, right. or make it up, which I'm not secure about. Mm -hmm. Although I've been doing things recently that are almost like that, where I, these Cecil Taylor uh, celebrations, I, I did one at the Whitney, uh, with a wonderful bass player named Michael Bicio, who plays wow. with Matthew Shipp's trio. And he's just a monster. I mean, the first time I read wow. with him, I thought, you know, well, you know, musicians, when they're wow. not used to reading with poets, they're tentative and they do little plings and stuff. He came charging him like a mammoth. I said, man, I've always wanted that, you know. Wow. Now he's going to push my ass. And we, we did it for an hour. Wow. It was fabulous. And he's a terrific guy, too. But the, it's a problem. I mean, just yeah. how do you... I mean, I could kind of sit there and go, you know, but I don't want to do that. Um, and I have to have the text. But what I was going to say, some of these Cecil things, I have a long text that I wrote in 87 when I quit smoking. And I was scared, like, as a lot of us did, that we wouldn't be able to write anymore without the cigarettes, without the coffee, the whole routine. And so I said, okay, I'm going to take all Cecil's records, of which there are about 50 at that time, wow. And I'm just going to sit down and write. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to go on and on. And I wrote, you know, 160 long line pages. And now I use that. I read it at these occasions, but I improvise off it. I, I may repeat things. I mean, I've learned to kind of jump around and use it like a matrix, like a, like a, a performance piece. So I, I, that's as far as I've gotten. But I can't play the drums while I'm doing that. Mm. And I've done that with guys like Thurston Moore and you know all kinds of musicians, which are, you know, is really inspiring. You know. In fact, I'm about to go do a thing with Thurston again on the, this Friday, actually, in that's Europa. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, so, so you know, you know, somebody I've been thinking about lately that I don't, my friends and I don't really speak about her much. But she really lingers in the background of my mind, and I'm just betting that she does for you as well. And that's Gertrude Stein. Oh, yeah. Stanzas and meditations, poetry and grammar. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the later linear books so much, or even the making of Americans, which I actually have struggled with. But particularly those poetry ventures just seem so amazing to me, even in, even in the lightness and frivolity sometimes. Um, there's a, there's enough darkness to to really uh, slice the melon. Anyway, I don't know how you feel about you know. Well, I remember getting a copy of the, one of those Yale editions. There are eight volumes that came out in the fifties of her unpublished work. Yeah. Uh, the, the one called Bee Time Vine. I bought. I remember at a used bookstore on Eighth Street when I lived there in fifty eight, fifty nine, and. The, Totally knocking out. I mean, I knew about her kind of from the autobiography and you know, the prose works, but I didn't really know how far she, out she could be. And then I got really turned on. And, I mean, there's not enough recording of her. I wish she had yeah. 
I wish. Been a lot, but the people didn't do that then, I guess. And the, the equipment wasn't easy. And I don't know. It's funny how it's all turned around. But then, of course, the, the feminist revolution happened, and that caused a lot of her books to be reprinted yeah. all at once. I mean, a lot of those uh, the books that Bennett Surf of all people, who was the editor at Random House, and he he liked her. I'm sure he didn't know what the fuck she was writing, but he liked her. You know, she had that personality, and she came over on that tour. Right. And the, of course, the press all made fun of her, totally. You know, but but she, I, she seemingly didn't care. I mean, she got to do that. You know, and she got her books published in you know, Random House, New York, big publisher. You know, and then all of that stuff when the war happened, she got dumped on Yale. And a guy, Donald Gallup, who was a friend of hers, and Van Vecht, Calvin Van Vecht, and they, I mean, there were these trunks, I understand, that had mm. like laundry lists and shit, and plus incredible works by her. And, and, and I think they're not even all cataloged yet. I, the last, I think Alice Notley and Ann Waldman went there a few years ago, and I don't think they were properly cataloged. But um, they're there. But anyway, yeah, that book. Um, and I remember St. Mark's, uh, the Poetry Project had a 24-hour marathon, Stein reading, mm. um, back in the uh, wow. late 70s, I think. And everybody, Alan, Alan read from uh, Making of Americans ah, as, if it, as if it was like a mantra, you know. I, I mean, it was a wonderful way to read it. I mean, it made it more fun, you know, more rhythmic. Maddening book. Oh, Maddening. Yeah, to, to get through it. Waylon told me he read it, actually, on a, on a no, I guess it was... Uh, Jack read it, Hirschman. Uh, he loved it. He loved yeah. it. But, but, but you know, she, she's not... She, she's in the Library of America, but it was it, particularly a couple of weeks ago, the stanzas and meditations, my God. Just amazing, inventive work. Did I tell you that story about what Whalen did at Vancouver one day during a class uh -huh. where Whalen, where uh, Olson and Duncan and maybe Alan were arguing heavily about some weighty matter? <laughs> and, and Phil, of course, who wasn't part of the teaching group, he was asked, he, Alan got the, bless him. That got them to the college to send a plane ticket for, for Phil, who was starving down here in Beaver yeah. Street. And he came up, and he would always, Phil would always sit with us in the, the, the audience, with the kids, and doodle on the, the blue, those blue examination books that were piled at the door. He would always take one, and he'd make it amazing, you know, how he was, drawings and poems. Yeah. And, did, and then when we left, he'd hand it to the who were sitting next to him, so everybody <laughs> wanted to be sitting next to him. But anyway, during this heavy session, he got up. He, there was a blackboard behind these guys, and he started writing on the blackboard. And what he was writing was, I don't know, 30 or 40 titles of Gertrude Stein books. Oh, yeah. He just kept making columns and columns wow. of her titles. And finally, you know, even Olson was kind of looking around, and he's totally <laughs> upstaging these heavyweights. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? You know, and Phil slapped down the chalk when he finished, got to the bottom of the end of the board, turned to, the, to us and, the, and said, you want to learn how to write, read those, and sat down. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it was an incredible moment, you know, and, and the guys on stage never recovered. Yeah, and we knew that Olson couldn't stand Stein. I mean, he, he, you know, he <laughs> well, of course, of course, he was absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, when when I, I I went to the Zen Center one day in '75, and I'm sitting there, and the Roshi looks at me and he points at me. He says, "He says, what are you doing here?" Oh no, he looks at me and he says. I know who you are, and I said, his name is Baker Rach Roshi, Richard Baker Roshi. He said, I know who you are, and I said, who am I? He said, you're the great, great wiggler, because I have all these ticks and all that. And, and then he said, what are you doing here? I said, I want to be the Roshi, just like that. And he said, well, come up and take my place. And I said, no, look, there's one thing, wanting to be the Roshi, another thing, getting ready to be the Roshi. So he said, why don't you come and learn to sit quietly for 45 minutes and I'll make you the Roshi. And then after that exchange, this very heavy set guy got up and his arms are down like this and he said, 
he started talking like, well, by golly, blah, 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 talking like that, real ham bone America, you know. He said, there was a very wonderful man named Charles Olson who said, and he quoted Olson, then he went on, and another uh, man, uh, William Carlos Williams, he proposed, blah, blah, blah. He went on and on, and I was in my mind. I thought, this is this wonderful retired pharmacist or professor from somewhere in the Northwest. I had the area right, and it's so great hearing him. And I started leaving, and this guy came up to me and uh, made a comment about the great wiggler, and, and, and he said, you know, that was Philip Whalen. And I thought, whoa, wow. And so I turned around and went back, introduced myself. And he said, I'm going up to the Buddhist bookshop on Van Ness. Do you want to join me? I said, yes, yes. And so we walked together up there. I remember he always kept his hands down. And he had that, that by golly kind of voice, just as, you know, oh, geez. Yeah. And all that. <laughs> it, it just cracked me up. It was like the farthest thing from what I expected from a guy who wrote on Sourdough Mountain and was balancing Heraclitus with the pancakes. <laughs> it was too much for me. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember going to the zoo with him in Vancouver, <laughs> which is his idea, a terrific idea. And, yeah. and he went where the seals were, and they're all going, wah, wah, wah. And he, he's doing that. He's imitating them. Oh. And having a great time, you know, laughing and making their noises and back to them. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's the soul of that guy. I mean, he's... Was, oh, that's that's wonderful. It's yeah. so funny to have him there. I mean, he was a great counter. I'm not putting down Olson. I mean, he's it was great, but you know, to have this counterweight of Phil Whalen with this wonderful humor about all of it, you know, about all of our lives, really, you know, not just it's not so fucking earnest about you yeah. know, what did pound mean this or no. no. <laughs> yeah. You you know, yeah. sometimes I think Olson. Uh, God damn, that, that, like the Kingfishers, mm -hmm. I have read and reread that poem because I want to do something with the same kind of exquisite power. <laughs> and you know, maybe that's wrong, you want to emulate, but you know, I mean, I'm learning from it, is yeah, what I'm saying, know. really. It is so damn powerful, and the letter to the Melville Society is mm -hmm. such a great powerful piece, mm -hmm. and on and on, uh, in cold hell and thicket. I thought, who is this guy? <laughs> Where did he come from? My God. Just amazing. Anyway, that's all. Just a little what's spout the, on... Uh, oh, even the, though he... I mean, he left Pound for good reason. He didn't like the uh, anti-Semitism. He didn't like the racism. And so he left him. And, and okay, Grandpa, goodbye. There was a little book that way, you know. But uh, but I think he still had some love for him and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. what a, what an awesome yeah. it's, it's, I think a sort of a total consciousness he tried to embrace everything and uh, he wrote about himself as you know as big man's because he was big six man, yeah. nine or something big man's but his his uh, the inner voice was so big it was so magnificent anyway you know. So, to tell you a little Olson story. Um, <clears throat> before I went to Vancouver, I tried to get the Brown, I was living in Providence, get the Brown English Department to bring people like him to give readings. They didn't do anything. And I had actually written, I took it upon myself, which I felt horrible about instantly, to write to Olson and kind of offer him but I had no, I was not part of the Brown yeah. Law. I had no reason. I was just so full of, you know, you got to right. do this and stuff. And then, then I didn't hear, and they didn't do it. And this was probably a couple of years before Vancouver. So when I approached the actual man, you know, and this towering over me, mm. I was a little, <laughs> little trepidate. You know, what, what's this guy going to say? This guy, he got me all interested, and then he didn't come through, and you know, what oh. bullshit and everything. So I went up and I, t I said my name, and he looked at me with those incredible startled eyes. Yeah, you look, you look like. And he immediately gave me a giant hug, <laughs> and he just hugged me almost too tight. And then, and then he looked at me and he said, "We know those bastards, don't we?" Oh. <laughs> I mean, what an incredible response! Because here's this kid, really, you know, kind of feeling terrible about overstepping, and 
you know, didn't know him, and I heard stories about this guy can be really tough and gruff, and you know, he, I never found him that way. And I, I must say, speaking of Pound and all that kind of thing, the Pound influence on Olson to be historically collaging everything, yeah. and, and you have to read about linear A and all this thing, and we all came away from his class with notebooks full of all that stuff. Can't wait to get home and read it. Of course, we didn't read any of it. I mean, except for the ones that followed him to Buffalo and probably did read it. But I mean, people like Palmer and me, I mean, what what I really took away from it was the man's like instant, He, you know, he could be talking about that stuff and some poor kid who probably didn't understand how at all would yell out something. Mm. It could be the dumbest thing. And he would, he would act like somebody slapped him. Oh. And he would take something from that and go on in that direction. Wow. I, yeah, I had never seen a mind you know, able to do that on, on call. You know? Just, it almost didn't matter. And I thought, okay, then, wow. then the subject matter really doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and years later, I gave a reading, I just thought of this connection, at the Tassajara Bread Store. And Duncan was in the front row. And I was reading, I don't know what I was reading. And I finished, and I'm in, the, in that state that you're in after a reading where you're not really there, and, and people... Duncan ran up to me, and I do remember this. It's the, I think it's the only thing I ever remembered that anyone ever said to me after, immediately after a reading. He said, well, then, of course, you agree that there's no problem with subject matter. <laughs> wow. Now, <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, you know. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Let me see if I can, that's interesting really to me, because let me see, I really love what you were talking about, your process early on here. You know, so I'm reading a poem of yours, or if I may say, my very close friend, Paul Vangelisti, with whom I'm staying with, I don't know if you know his poems. A little. Yeah, he had a, a book from Sun and Moon, and, and he's very close to those people, and he's a translator of Italian, and most, you know, and so for years... I would read him, and then I began reading you very seriously, and I'm thinking, these poems, they're art slash artifact, they're, they're like found objects to me. Your poems, to me, at their best and at my best, are like, like rocks or boulders I find on the trail. Because they don't, you know, and whereas I have, a, I'm always have, remember I told you yesterday when you were interviewing, so I'm a moralist, I, you know, I, they're moral, they, I always have a, a fucking moral, you know, and, uh, and, and I'm trying to explain things, and I would like to be able to do that, and I can't do it, and I love it, and I, and those are the poets I admire the most, that I can't be like, I'm not going to be, it's not going to happen for me. I'm who I am. I got up in the morning, I made breakfast, I looked outside and there was a blackbird. <laughs> End of the poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the poem. And I, I don't know what I'm... It's like, because it's so deep internalized in me, I can't get away from it. And, you know, um, yeah. but you? so that's it. I mean that as a high honor, you know. But you know that, I, I can't that's what I mean as a high honor, that I feel I, that way. I will, I will sometimes find myself writing in the midst of all that, a moral pronouncement, and I'll, you know, <laughs> when, when that first happened, I, I probably erased it or I wanted to erase it. Yeah. I thought that's not what I'm doing, but then I realized that came because of all this other stuff. It came. I have to be in the field before Ooh. I can find a stone. You know, it's, wow. it's, it's like that. Uh, then somebody would say, "Well, why don't you dump all the rest of it out?" No, <laughs> no, that's that's as important as that. I, yeah. And that's part of what I'm trying to say, maybe. All that stuff that people say is a gibberish or something is just as important as saying you shouldn't shit on the floor or, you know, you shouldn't hit your friend or, or you know, whatever. A simple sentence of instruction or yeah. ethics or whatever you and, and inspire I do have me to think of. I do have to say, I feel my, if I got your process right, even though I'm a, a, a narrative linear poet, I mean, Bukowski was my teacher. You know, and it took years for me to get out from under that and to, to develop my own thing. And, uh, but he was the person I spent a lot of time with. And, and it's like, uh, but when I write, I don't think about what I'm writing. It just completely, 
it pours out of me and it is what it is. And if I have to struggle with it too much, I don't do it. I won't. After a certain point, if, if I have to revise too much, out it goes, you know. On the other hand, lately, because of reading Eliot, remember Kyle, I was telling you, Eliot has changed a lot of my methods in the last month or so. Because I, I, I want to get to that I, sort of that, that every line counts thing. It's like it's like Gregory Corso once pointed out to me. You read the Auden's poem to Yeats. The, every line has a statement. Every line makes a point. And I looked at it, and by God, Gregory's right. It's incredible. So <laughs> what I'm saying is I, I it all just pours out of me, and if it doesn't, it's it's reception, and then I hear a voice and they say, "Oh God, you're so close to the sacred, man. You mm -hmm. just sit there and it pours <clears throat> out of you." But damn it, that's what it does. That's how I make my poems, yeah, yeah. and then I have to be careful how I work after that to to keep that moment. I want to remember I told you I want to find new words. I want to find other words, and the moralism is going to always be there. It just who I am, it's just going to be there. You the remember, instruction. You remember that incredible thing that Beckett said one one night at drunk in a bar? Who's this? Beckett. Sam oh, Beckett. yeah. He said, I want Creeley told this. Creeley spent a night drinking with Sam Beckett in Paris. I mean, you know, wouldn't you? You know, And he said, I, we're going, well, what did he, you know, what was it like? What did he say? And he said, I want a word or the condition of a word, that's the way Bob would say, uh, that's exactly this high, exactly this shape, exactly this color, exactly this density, with a sense that has never been before. You know, I go, oh man, that's why I love this guy. You know? wow. <laughs> I didn't even know that, but you know, Bob was going, You're an astonishing man, an incredible, impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I read Becca and I think it's like the words are howling through me, the images, you uh -huh. know, and then I realize, it's just like with your poems, Beckett is the same way to me. It's, just, it's a found object, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's something you experience, it's an experience, you either go with it or you don't, you know, and, and if you love language. Oh, I love the way you it, said, you know. Very early, I real I tried to write novels like Joyce because I like was, what Joyce because I knew Joyce and I was he was his secretary while he was writing Finning His Wake actually, you know that famous story where he's writing things down and somebody That's comes right. and knocks on the door and says come in and Beckett writes come in, in the middle of it and later he's reading it back to Joyce says did I say that and he said yeah okay it stands, <laughs> I mean who knows but. But, yeah, so many, I mean, but, we but, all love but, Joyce, and, but you know, then, I, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to yeah. connect it. Yeah. Um, that then Beckett realized very soon that he had to not be that man that he mm. adored with all the knowledge and all the mm. vocabulary. I had to come from my ignorance. Mm. All those characters, Malloy and everything, came from profound mm. ignorance of what I didn't know. You know, I, I instantly went, wow, you know, because I don't... I don't feel like an intellectual anyway. I don't. I don't know all that yeah. stuff. I've heard it, you know. But <laughs> I've even tried to. I read being in nothingness once. I got nothing out of it. I mean, <laughs> not even any being. <laughs> nothing. To, but you know, I was thinking about connecting it with with Augustine in a way. You know, this business of you know writing all this dense stuff and then coming out with a simple statement sometimes. I was being interviewed, actually I was hired by the gallery, Hauser and Worth, that is Gustin's estate now, and, and he, they hired me to come to this beautiful show of Gustin's in Venice, the two mm. last September, and to give a lecture mm. at the Academia and about our collaborations, and then I was interviewed by his daughter, actually, and somehow, you know, sometimes when you're in, in that kind of pressure, you come up with something that you probably had been thinking about a long time but never expressed that way. And I found myself talking about, you know, his so-called change, Augustine's painting, change. You know, that all those, whatever you want to call images, you know, hoods or whatever you call them, they all had to survive the battle of the plasticity universe. In other words, they had to go through all that stuff that he painted for 20 years of 
you know, does this piece of paint go here or does it oh, go, God. it has to be here, then there, yeah. then there, then yeah. then everywhere, and then it stops for, just for a moment. I mean, that's what you talk about. Uh, to get those forms, they had to survive the yeah. plasticity battle, and that's what they, after Mondrian, they all talked about plasticity, I mean, the, the formal sense of paint. Uh, he, you know, don't think, I didn't fight that out with every one of those paintings. I mean, if there's something that looks stupid there, that survived that battle. You know, and he'd say, I'm not a dummy. <laughs> I, I know I'm a good painter, he'd say sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I know. You know. But, but that's, that was that process. And finally, he, he said, I wanted to do that all my life, and I couldn't allow it. He, he told me one time, I stayed up all night, and I, I said, I'll be like, it was when he was in New York, in the studio in New York, I'll be like Matisse, I'll paint, or Picasso, I'll paint the whole studio, I'll paint the frames, the, the paint right. pots, the chairs, the telephone, the mm -hmm. window, I'll paint it. And I said, I painted it all night, this amazing painting, and I was exhausted, and I went to sleep. And then I got up the next morning, and I thought, oh my God, what have I done? You know, it's like it's like Alec Guinness at the end of River Kwai. You know, <laughs> what have I done? You know, <laughs> he built this fucking bridge for the Japanese. Am I gonna have to change my career? Who, who the fuck am I now? And I, he said, I went to the studio and I looked at it. He said it wasn't it wasn't there. I mean, he meant I mean it, he had painted it, but it didn't hold, and I had to take mm. it out. And he said I did that over and over again, and I could I couldn't stand it. And finally, I got to the point, I guess I'd done enough of wow. all this process that I was allowed to make a shoe, oh, or yeah. a little auto, these little paintings he did, or drawings, actually, too. And, I mean, imagine all that. I mean, this, I, mean I was thought, this guy's this titanic artist, I mean, compared to, you know, yeah. sniveling little poet. I mean, you know, you know, this, he never made me feel yeah, like that. He, yeah. he loved the idea of, you know, Picasso, you know, illustrating a book of El Ward's, oh, yeah. and then El Ward would get the money because Picasso right. would sign all the copies and give it to him because he didn't need it. You know, I mean, it's a beautiful book. He loved that idea of poets and painters. You know, and the poets. Would, he'd say, "You don't have to worry. You'll never have any money." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, he'd talk about how we went from, I mean not being able, able to afford good oil paint and painting with house enamel to being hired by Sidney Janice and selling paintings for like $30,000 a picture. All those guys did, Frank, Klein, de Kooning, you, you know, what, how that changes you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it has to. It has to. It, not a good thing to happen to you, even though you need the money and you're glad to have it. And you can raise your kids and do all, you know. Well, you know, uh, this reminds me of, the, you know, of, um, I was reading Rilke's letters on Cezanne, mm -hmm. which are so, there's some of the earliest stuff on Cezanne, as you know, is written by, by Rilke and, and um, so many other poets who have a, well, Stein, one of her great linear books is Picasso. Her book on Picasso, which is a very easily understood primer on Pablo Picasso, mm -hmm. and there's so many other examples. I had another one in my mind that now escapes me. But, uh, you know, I, I wrote a short essay on de Kooning's The Last Paintings. And sometimes I think of those in terms of what I was saying about your work. You can look at the women and you see the, the women finding their way out of de Kooning's canvases grotesquely. And you see Montauk Highway, and you actually see the highway, and whatever. And then you have these color variations, and they just what they are. They're color variations, and it makes me think of what I was quoting to you earlier when Wallace Stevens said, "Music then is feeling, not sound." <laughs> and I keep thinking of that because it was one of Bob Kaufman's favorite things to say when Bob would stand in the street and he would start reading a love song and he would truncate it into uh, Ode to Walt Whitman by Lorca and then he would do a, a little bit of Wallace Stevens and then he would do somebody else. He would just declaim in the street, music that is feeling, not sound. And he wrote it for me in a book and signed it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I thought of that, you know, in terms of, again, what I was saying about you and 
Hall and, and, and other people, yeah, certainly Ashbery, for God's sake, whose work I just, it's just delicious, you know. And, 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 and there's his friend Frank O'Hara, who's so easy to understand, so easy to go, go into. The difference, I'm, I'm so fascinated by that. And then here you are coming out with Poet, which I've heard now a few times, pieces of it, and it's this linear narrative book. So you actually have gone, be more, basically, in more. many ways. <clears throat> It's got a lot of litany and repetition. Huh? It's got a lot of, you know, the poet is the poet. Is. Yeah, okay, but still. Yeah. No, 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 but not exactly narrative. But, yeah. But uh, I was going to say, I, you know, I knew John a long time, and only once did I ever have a serious conversation with him about poetry. Wow. <laughs> he would always defend, he, he would make a joke. He was incredibly witty, and it, he, it would roll off him. You know, you wouldn't ask him a serious question. And one time, just circumstances set it up. Jimmy Schuyler had started to give readings. He had never yeah. given readings right. in his life. So he came to the Berkshires and he gave a reading there. And John came over and we all went out to eat after that. And I got sat at the end of the long table, Jimmy in the middle. John and I were one end, kind of isolated from everybody who wanted to talk to Jimmy, of course, after his reading. And we started talking about, you know, what do you, you know, you use a pencil, you use a notebook, you know, that kind of kitchen stuff. Hmm. And then got actually into a little bit, the most I ever got out of him about how he writes and you know, how he feels about it. That's interesting. Is that right? It's just yeah. one time. He would, all, he would never. And I, I, I Why is that? I'm sympathetic. I mean, I don't like to either. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I never. Uh, the thing I should have said about teaching was I, I never taught a writing class unless somebody put a gun to my head. Oh, yeah. I mean, I taught. The time I did taught that semester, I taught Beckett and, and Kafka. I didn't. Yeah. We read the books. You know, we're not. I'm not going to take your writing and say, take this word out. And, yeah, you know, just, I'm you, not good at that anyway. Now, David said, when I first got to New College, Miltzer took me aside and he said, don't teach a writer's workshop. Hmm. Talk about poetry, talk about the poets. And, and that's what they did with that poetics program. And unfortunately, the, kid, the, the students, the kids, wanted a writer's workshop and I had to do yeah. a couple of them and I hated it because it's it's so exploitative in a way it's just so bad it was bad for my soul I could sit for somebody one-on-one -on -one yeah and and talk about their work one-on-one -on -one, but not in a group more than two people as a group and so when David and I did a six-week thing at Bird and Beckett and we charged yeah. we charged about a thousand bucks we had about 16 people and we determined at the beginning it wasn't going to be a workshop. And, and by God, so many people wanted, they were dying to show us their poems. Mm -hmm. So I would take poems home with me, but I wouldn't do it there. We talked about ideas, mainly. Mm -hmm. We just talked about ideas. We talked about poets and ideas. Uh, that's why I was getting at that you've never really yeah, yeah. been an academic. When <clears throat> I meant not a degree that you didn't go into academia and, and start teaching. Clark Coolidge, uh, the visiting professor for a full year. <laughs> I mean, Thank they, God. They yeah. always try to get the kids at Naropa always wanted me to give them assignments, yeah. which I never did. I, I would say, well, you know, keep a notebook, you know. I'm going to talk, we're going to read They these want things. direction. They want direction. They want to take something home and do something and come back. And the, I, only, the only thing I found out in teaching to be a little self was that you better be prepared, you know, and, and that's not about assignment, it's like sometimes I would come, you know, and I just don't feel I was ready for it, you know, and when I was, man, they, they're so different. So shall we uh, say we've done it? And uh, yeah, we're